Welcome to the Shared Practices Podcast, Season 6. We have a really unique opportunity today to do a, uh, uh, first off, uh, a returning guest who has provided so much value to our podcast in Season 2, but also a, a a previous relationship partnership of mine that we get to talk about uh, from a different perspective, all of the things that that were involved and and all the opportunities that uh, this this company this individual uh, is associated with. So and and first off, just a, a great personal friend. So I want to welcome to the show, Dr. Hunter Smith. Hunter, how's it going? Man, thanks so much for having me. I'm doing really well. How are you guys? Good. It's uh, it's been crazy. It's uh, I'm pulling lots of teeth and doing lots of implants and, and, uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun. So, uh, it's been, it's been good here in Indiana. And today actually is my last day on terminal leave in the army. So I've got a little bit of scruff. I think I might try a goatee. I'm kind of like you, like I can't get facial hair on my upper cheeks, but I can get on the lower cheeks and like the goatee area. So I'm going to try and see what I can do post army here. That's, that's definitely the strategy for sure. (laughs) Well, I wanted uh, you, you and I had kind of talked back and forth. Um, I wanted to make sure that we had the ability to represent um, our partnership from all aspects. Um, there, the the opportunity to buy some practices with you and Will was an incredible opportunity that I am so grateful for. And, I, and when I look back at, I, I am grateful for so many aspects from the beginning to the end of that relationship. Um, But it was also just a weird relationship of like, not typically what you guys do. And so I wanted to give you the the chance to explain your model, your platform, and how you guys typically partner with people um, and the opportunities that you provide to doctors uh, in in your organization. So, um, and and also just kind of give the post-op from from your perspective. You know, we've obviously represented it on, on the podcast so far from my perspective. And and no matter what, no matter how you try and keep bias out, like everyone's experience is a little bit different and, and everyone kind of tells the story the, the way they want it to be told and the way they want it to be heard. And I, and I think transparency is something that's important to us at Shared Practices. And and so I I would love to hear <laughs> if there needs to be any corrections to the record of things I've said, uh, but also just kind of where your your head's at and where you're coming from and, and looking back. Uh, the things you you learned or would change or, you know, all the above. So uh, it's kind of kind of a fun opportunity to do this. So I appreciate your willingness to to talk. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I think it's really, really important to highlight that there's no animosity at all between either of us. And, and I mean, it, and it can be hard because partnerships are, are like marriages in a lot of ways. And we all know how those end sometimes and sometimes they end am- amicably. Um, and this one ended, I think, as amicably as it could. Um, given the situations, just different goals, uh, as you shared on the podcast, uh, lots of times, and and for us, you know, I think that speaks to, to both your character and and kind of how we operate as a company, and, and hopefully us individually. In that, hey, it's it's there's the business side of this of this what we're trying to do, and if it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. No matter how much you know financial incentive or, or personal incentive or how we feel about the other person, so uh, I think it's really important to highlight that. that Absolutely no ill will. I hope I know it not on our side. And I don't think either on your side. Um, no, it, absolutely. And and in fact, the the overwhelming feeling is, like I said earlier, gratitude, and then just a twinge of guilt. I still have this like lingering sense of like, man, I bought these practices with with Hunter and Will, and then I said I was going to be the, the local managing doctor, and I've kind of abandoned them and moved on to other things. Um, and so there is this sense of like. Man, did I did I not live up to my end of that? You know, even though we ended things well on a great terms, uh, you know, there, for some reason, I'm uh, guilt is an emotion I'm good at, and so <laughs> that one just kind of uh, lingers a little bit there as well. No, I think we, I think we're understanding. Uh, both sides are understanding of it, and, and frankly, I, you know, you, you'd given me the opportunity uh, soon after we kind of started our different paths um, to come on and. At the time, I was, you know, I didn't want anybody to think that there was any ill will. I wanted you to be able to tell a story. It's certainly your platform and, and George and the rest of Share Practices platform and, and it, y'all story to tell. Um, but I, I, what I wanted to jump on about uh, as I thought more about it was, one, show that, you know, there is no anim- animosity or anything like that. And two, 
um, hopefully give them some perspective because this the the type of market that I'm in where where there are limited partners or or minority partners or partners at a GV a JV or a practice level that are part of a bigger organization is a really growing segment of our dental industry. Um, and just like solo practices and just like associateships with with large DSOs, there's the good, bad, and the ugly with those and the good and the bad and the ugly companies. So I wanted the opportunity to kind of do a, a recap of our relationship um, and then maybe explain some about GPS, but whether I do that or not is kind of up to you. Um, because I think there was some uniqueness in the situation. I mean, obviously there was, you know, with you got projects going all the time. So, you know, it's <laughs> there's the uniqueness built around that. And I think it's important to highlight some of those things so that people can kind of get a 10,000 foot view. It's like, okay, if I'm looking at this specifically for me, um, sure. it didn't work for Richard's situation, but would it have worked for me and my goals? So I think, you know, you explaining what those goals were and then me explaining from, from our perspective, um, you know, what our goals were and kind of how they didn't align wasn't like a personal situation. It was more of a professional goal situation. And I think if those were just a little bit different, then it could have been a, a really long lasting partnership. I think one of the big things that uh, we differed on was I wanted to be placing implants. I wanted to be doing endo. I wanted to be, you know, investing in, in certain technology. I was looking at um, getting a CBCT in a van that I could drive around between the practices. Did I, t did I tell you that ever? Uh, I know there was the endoscopes and, you know, you got those all installed. And then um, I don't remember about the CBCT, to be honest with you. You may have, but. Well, and, and I, don't, I don't think I even told you guys, but I kind of knew that I was like, well, you know, we got to, there, I knew that it almost didn't, the practices didn't justify it. Like from a business decision, there wasn't enough surgery and implants and all of those things that even if we had the CBCT in house, that it would make sense from a business decision to do the CBCT. But I, it, it was one of those things that like I wanted it. And so I started looking at, I mean, I called around, I talked with people, different reps of, of different uh, installers that installed these CBCTs in a van because we had these three locations that were far enough away from each other that it didn't make sense to have a CBCT at one and then you could refer patients to the other ones. Um, and so it was one of those things of like, I was realizing that the direction my clinical practice wanted to go to was also different than what these practices could, could really accommodate and focus on um, from, from a business perspective as well. So, but let's, let's start from the beginning. So let's start from kind of where you guys were in your growth of, of GPS um, when I came on the scene and, you know, what were the factors that made you decide, okay, yeah, let's buy these three practices with Richard. Here's how we think it's going to work out. And then uh, versus what you kind of normally did with with other partners and on, on a practice level. Yeah, I think that'll highlight for sure. One of the, the differences for us was, you know, we were we weren't regional at the time, um, but we were fairly localized. Um, we were in a couple of states and, and I don't know if anybody knows where Jonesboro, Arkansas is. It's kind of on the far east side of, of Arkansas. So we were in the northwest parts of the state as well, which actually is probably almost as far as Indianapolis is. So we had some ge geographical spread there, but all of our partners at the time um, were either partners who had bought in um, that were providers within the practices that, that purchased in or that acquired alongside us with the intention of being the full-time provider um, clinically in the, in the practice. Um, we had not, well, we had purchased practices at the time where the associate stayed on and, and continued to practice, but there wasn't like another layer of, of somebody or something between that clinical provider and, and GPS. And so, um, you know, when we started connecting, you know, at the time, and I, I don't, uh, you can edit out any of this that you, that you feel you know, that you don't want to share, but, you know, you were looking at the locations yep. um, and kind of had reached out to me just because I've been on the podcast and, and we knew each other and knew how to walk multiple locations. Like, Hey, I'm, you know, am I crazy for thinking about this? Um, here's these three locations. Here's where they are geographically. Here's, you know, I kind of acted as a, as a sounding board for you. Um, and throughout that process, I think you saw, and this is not a knock on you or, or anybody else. You know, one of the challenges with multiple practice early on is lending. Um, and, you know, there wasn't a lot of lending options available to you individually at the time because you didn't have any you know, provider experience or ownership experience. Obviously, it was your first forte into ownership. Um, so that lending relations were hard to get. So where we could provide value immediately was was frankly the, the purchasing of the practices. Um, 
and also there's, you know, the, you, you don't know what you don't know. And, and there were some operational things that we felt we could add value to. Um, and I think we, we tried our best to perform those. Um, so when we stepped in, you know, you had those locations like, hey, we can partner with you on this. We can help you get them funded. Um, and then over time, you know, as you got out of the Army, you transitioned to more of a, a leadership role, a, a stronger equity position role at the practices. And these three are kind of your baby to do with what you want. We're the back end infrastructure. Um, you know, from our perspective, what then happened was, you know, again, these are not knocks. This is kind of just our perspective on it is, you know, we we were used to the partners being clinical leads. And then the other aspect that you were going to provide at the time was, you know, we had three locations with six hours away from our headquarters. We got to do some associate recruitment. Um, so, you know, luckily we never had to, had to really deal with any of that one during our, our, and still to this day, haven't had to in the tenure with those three locations. Um, but because of the position you were in with the army, I don't think that those things came to fruition quite the way that we both planned them to. Um, so it became more of a, you, I think felt like you were stuck in the middle of something. Um, and, and we felt like, you know, Richard's got these ideas and these things that he wants to do but who's available to go and do them and who's going to be the person that uh, is spearheading them and following up on them. And, and who does it affect at the practice level? So it's just a, that to me started the big, you know, difference in, in where we, where we saw the locations because um, we, we, because of the partnership structure, we created this artificial middleman situation that neither of us you know, wanted or planned. And frankly, it's not our model. It wasn't what you signed up for. What we provided to you wasn't what you signed up for either. So it's kind of a both sides were like, well, this is not really what we thought it was going to be. And I think a lot of it was out of both of our controls with your your army position, um, our growth trajectory, how we were getting lending at the time um, and kind of how we wanted to protect the practices and how we wanted to um, support the doctors on site. So that kind of started the, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the big difference there that we've, we've since learned is it's really hard to put someone who's a, a business minded person who has a lot of growth ideas for the practice, who wants to be really um, aggressive on, on strategies, but is not able to be kind of the clinical lead. Um, yeah. That was, that was kind of, I think the disconnect um, for, from our perspective. I think. Yeah, you, absolutely. No. And, and I think, um, I think I recognized real quickly some of the challenges that multi-practice owners have, which is when you are not the clinical lead, um, you, you can't be there in the day-to-day -day operations and kind of lead and influence the team and help uh, deal with, with little things before they become big things. And um, it's a hard role to fill. Um, and and I gained a lot of respect for, for you two very quickly um, in just seeing like, okay, there are some stressful moments. I mean, this is a people business where, where, you know, it's people's lives are wrapped up in these practices and their lives on the side don't stop when they're at work and, and, and things happen. Um, and, and I think you're absolutely right too, that I, number one, overcommitted, cause that's just a, a trend of, of my, myself, uh, for the last six years, uh, probably my whole life. But, uh, I thought I was going to get more clinical time in number one. And then number two, I got investigated by the army. The army conducted an investigation. I think you got a phone call. Yeah. You're probably thinking like, what the heck? What's, what's captain Lowe doing here? Um, <laughs> someone had found out because obviously we've got a podcast and this came up on the podcast. Um, someone found out that I was doing this and I had all the signatures in place. I had approved this with my commander, my commander's commander. Um, they knew I was working at these offices. I was partners on these offices, but someone somewhere, I still don't know who said that shouldn't be allowed. This, this, this captain shouldn't be allowed to own practices. Um, let's start an investigation and just throw a bunch of crap against the wall and see if anything sticks. And the attorney, when he talked to me said, normally we have an accuser and we have an evidence of wrongdoing when there's an investigation. He said, in your case, we don't have an accuser and we don't have any evidence of wrongdoing. So that's why I'm talking to you as the attorney and in investigating here. Um, and they spoke with you and, and they looked at everything. And they said, yep, everything's above board. But the one thing that came out of that investigation was they said, if a potential doctor was looking at working at one year practices or working at joining the army, um, 
how how would you decide what to do? And that would be a conflict of interest for you. So we don't want you recruiting for those practices while you're still in the army. And so that put a, a stop to a role that I was intending to fill for you all, um, wh which was kind of frustrating. Um, and like you said, fortunately, we didn't really need to kind of, that wasn't really an issue because we've had great doctors and great teams that have stayed on and, and stayed with you uh, the whole time. So um, but it, it it didn't go kind of how we originally envisioned it. Yeah. And I think, like I said, a lot of it was out uh, out of your control. I mean, I wouldn't categorize it. I mean, you're a little harder on yourself than I would be. I mean, it's over committing because it was, you know, you had the signatures in place. We had a game plan um, that, hey, on Thursday afternoons and some Fridays, we were going to we're going to do clinical work and we were going to go into different spots. And that didn't happen for a variety of reasons. And one of which is that it's really hard. You know, it's a it's really cool that you were able to to be a part of three locations um, as an owner during the army, but ultimately, uh, you know, you, you can only serve one master. Not that we're the master or anything like that. Sure. The army is. I mean, they, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. No doubt about that. Yeah. Uh, what you do? So if they say like, hey, you know, we can't, and you want to save your termination early leave days to to get out sooner and and not maybe blow those on a Friday at one of the locations that you may or may not see patients at. So the 20 ish hours a week that we had kind of theorized between the two of us clinically that were available turned out not to be. So now we're kind of stuck with, okay, we were going to use recruitment and to add clinical value to the practices. And because of things kind of out of both of our control, those couldn't happen. Um, so it's like, okay. And then you, you know, you get a wealth of information from the podcast and your listeners do and the people that you speak with. And so you got these ideas and they're, I mean, they're great ideas. They're things that we want to implement. But what I would caveat that with is like a good example that I can remember is, you know, we wanted to, to turn up marketing in one of our locations and really kind of push them some patients through. Um, you know, we talked about going with an agency that's been on you know, your podcast that does a great job with marketing that steps that would be a really sophisticated package for the for the practice. And I remember talking to Will about it. It's like, hey, you know, we've. It's not a rocky start with with Richard, but oh, I want to I want to do something here. Feel like we're on the same page with something. Let's 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 look into this. You know, and his first question was was a really good one for me. He's like, okay, who's going to see the patients? And, you know, then it was like, oh, OK, maybe we need to dive into it a little bit more. And then we look at the schedule and it's well, we're already 10 business days out for the new patients we have. Um, you know, let's ask the doctor on site, like, hey, can, do you want to work a Friday? Do you want to increase your availability? Do you want to uh, shorten these schedules or the, the time frames for the new patients? Um, and, you know, not that she was overwhelmed, but, you know, her answer was, you know, I'm pretty comfortable with with the, the schedule that I have now and kind of the flow of the office, it feels good. So it was that, that situation where you're caught that that's hard because you want to grow the practice. You want to improve the practice. You always want to drive new patients in, but we had a capacity issue, not a marketing issue. So mm -hmm. from your perspective, I'm sure it felt like, Oh, here's these guys again, telling me that we can't do something. Um, and from our perspective, it's like, I mean, Richard wants to do all this, the stuff that he's learning about. And, there's no one to implement it and and to actually see the patients that we would drive in. So that's just a it's an anecdotal example, but I think it speaks to kind of the relationship and, and where the goals started to to disalign. It's um, you know from a multi practice perspective versus a I think a lot of the guys and girls that listen to the podcast and George is included in this list. They went into a practice as an owner and they were the clinical leads. Mm -hmm. So. If you say, hey, I want to increase new patients and I want to see more new patients, that's your schedule. You're like, oh, well, I don't have anywhere to put them. I need to I need to work Fridays. Right. And that's a different position than I want to increase new patients at that office. You need to go, you know, work Fridays. And so she's like, well, wait a minute. You know, I've got a four day a week contract here. I make X amount. I'm comfortable with what I'm making. I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to do that. So um, it's that that's a, just a huge difference in what we were used to experiencing because we had clinical people on site that were the doctor leads that our partners that were on site were the clinical leads um, to the point that if they came to us and said, Hey, I want to increase new patients. Like, okay, well, you're the one that got to see them. Let's go get it. Um, and it, it just started that relationship of, you know, Richard's kind of stuck in the middle here where he's got the ideas. He's got good, good ideas, good things that'll grow the practices, but you know, how do we get it into the practice efficiently? You know, cone beams, another one, Great value add to the practice, implants add to the practice, but okay, who's going to be the one that does the training for the cone beams? Who's going to take the cone beams? Who's going to code out the cone beams? And then what's Richard's schedule going to be like when he wants to come in and place implants? Are we talking 
you know, two or three times a month and there's no consistency there or, or what. So it's just, it was a, it was a thing where we got caught on what exactly your role should be. Um, sure. And I think it was because it was different than what both sides saw and what both sides were used to experiencing. Certainly was different for us. We were, we were not prepared for, you know, a partnership that didn't, that, that wanted to be on the business side, but couldn't, because of get outside control, provide the clinical aspects that we, you know, they were the lead doctors in our other locations. So, yeah. And, and I think it made me realize real quick, the, the difficulty to lead change and introduce change at not just one office where, where you're not the clinical lead, but multiple offices. I mean, it, you're trying to change systems and change things that a, a team is useful used to, or introduce a new procedure, introduce something new, and you're not there to drive that change. It becomes hard real quick um, to implement, um, and 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 you have to be real selective. And and some things like I saw one thing that was worth it for us to change up front was the switch to open dental. Um, and that was hard. It, 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 you know, teams, they get through it, but it's always anytime you kind of throw them off the, from the routine of what they're used to and how they do things on a day-to-day basis, it's hard. And, and choosing what changes to introduce to the practice um, is a big part of practice ownership. And I felt like I was, I was grateful that you guys had the oversight and the ability to look at these things and say, yeah, we could ramp up the marketing at this practice, but where do we put the patients? And I saw it and, and I, I couldn't really argue with it because I was like, no, I absolutely agree. They're, they're, it doesn't make sense um, when, you, when you look at our capacity and, and we don't have additional capacity. And, I, and so it was good learning for me on a lot of aspects. And I, I think another aspect was that you guys were great operators. You were great at um, working through challenges, working through sticky situations um, of making sure that you know, people can get heated and, and um, you know, the wrong thing can come out. And you guys were always very level headed. You were always, you know, had the best interest of people in mind. Uh, you know, we re- led these practices through COVID um, and and through all the challenges of, of closing practices down and opening them back up and PPE and, uh, you know, helping people through kind of thinking through all of this stuff. I was very grateful to have you both as examples of how to handle these difficult situations. Um, and, and I made some mistakes and, and I, I, I was grateful that you guys were there to help me out through those mistakes as well. Well, I mean, look, we all make mistakes. We made, we made mistakes in the partnership that, I mean, we make mistakes in the, the decision-making at the practice level. I mean, it's, it's part of it. And you and George t- spoke really eloquently on it at, on your podcast a lot that I listened to kind of talking about where you, where you purchased the new practices is, Sometimes there are decisions, you know, that you're making that, you know, you're disappointing somebody, you know, somebody's going to be like, no, nah, I mean, that's not what I want. Um, you know, the the one thing that I would take a little bit of exception to, and I don't think you guys meant it, you know, in ill will, but you said, you know, the multi practices have to sometimes make decisions that are for the money. Um, and I would phrase that a little bit differently in that, you know, we have a responsibility to our doctors and our partners, and even as, as kind of gross as it sounds, our lending partners, because, you know, we're in the, we're in the growth game, you know, for, for just a, to kind of put it you know, in a personal experience for you is, you know, if you guys are doing these, these implant centers um, and you're looking to grow, you're going to get a lending partner. Um, and if you make a decision that, that costs money for an extended period of time or that, that negatively impacts the business, maybe it's a, uh, Oh Lord, I don't know. Uh, one that we almost ran into was uh, the insurance. Like I'm going to, I'm going to strip out all the insurance, and we're going to renegotiate and then re-add, and then we're going to have. But now, what you have is a month, two, three months on a TTM period that show profit decline. And sure, it's explainable, um, but now you're going to your lenders and be like, look, I can, I can get this practice from zero to profitability in X number of months. Um, it's just another story to tell. So ultimately you have a responsibility to the, to the business and the people in it and, and not necessarily the money, but the money is what, what drives the business. So I don't think you guys meant it in, you know, in an ill intended way, but um, you know, I, I think it's a little unfair to categorize that, you know, we have to make decisions for, for money. We have to make decisions that allow the workers and at the practice level the dentists at the practice level our partners to not lose money or to not be negatively impacted 
Um, so that, that was just, uh, you know, whereas again, a lot of your listeners and a lot of people that are going to go in own practices are not going to run into that because, if they buy a solo location and this, this advice is extremely good. It's like, Hey, take control over the practice. You know, if, if you need to break it a little bit to make it better, that's, that's perfectly fine. But ultimately you're the one eating that, you know, that if I drive capacity that I got to go do it. If I piss off an associate and they leave, I got to be the one to go in there to do it or my business suffers and it affects me personally and only me. And that's a different situation than that may piss off an associate. They may leave, now I don't have anybody to go in there and do that. Now my partner's distributions are lower than I promised them. Or now my practice is bought into a location that is less profitable than they bought in at. And, or my lender is looking at me like, what in the world? Why is this location going down? So it's not about the money is kind of a scoreboard, right? Of how sure. the business is doing. So again, I don't think of anything it was meant by it, but it's just a little bit of a, of a caveat there is like, it's more of who it's affecting. If, if you make those decisions and ultimately if it's a hard one, someone is going to, as you guys said, someone's going to be like, Oh, I wouldn't have done it like that. Or, Oh, that negative impacted me more than it did this person. Um, and as a business owner, you gotta, you gotta make those, you gotta be understanding and empathetic of the other side as we all tried to be during COVID. It's like, yeah, I mean, sucks. I don't want to shut down the practice at all. I don't want to, you know, I don't want you guys to have to go on unemployment. I don't want these doctors to not have access to anything um, until we get PPE because they make too much money for unemployment. Um, but, you know, I got to protect the business. I got to work with the landlords to make sure that there's, you know, the, the rent's down. I got to work with the lenders to make sure that the, uh, that we have some deferment on that so that when this thing is over, we're going back into a business that's still able to provide for you and your family. Um, and I know it sucks in the short term, but it's what we have to do. So I appreciate the kind words on the fact that we're, you know, quote unquote good at it, but it's more just trying to be, you know, empathetic and open-minded to who's affected, how they're affected. And, um, knowing that at some point you know, someone's going to be affected that you wish it, they didn't have to be. And, and you got to kind of own that as a, as a business owner. So we tried really hard to, to do that as I, as I know you have and are experiencing now in your, your new ventures. No. And, and I appreciate the clarification because at the end of the day, I don't think shared practices has ever said that like, uh, like we're not like, we're very pro profit. We want dental <laughs> dental owners to be very profitable and do well and make lots of money um, and, and do what's right for their teams and their patients and all that. I think the hardest thing for me was to, um, and, and it's, and it's continue. This is going to be a continuing problem. Um, it's like, I want the ability to tank the profitability of my practice for X, Y, and Z reason. You can make that decision in a silo when you're the solo owner. You can't make that decision in a silo when, when you're partnered with other people, when there are multiple practices involved, um, because you're sharing the risk you're sharing. You've got that lender, you've got these partners, you've got other people that are affected when you make decisions like that. And so um, the decision making becomes more nuanced. And, and I think you're absolutely right to kind of correct probably how I was setting, saying it or, 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 you know, the way it was framed. Um, but, but I, I definitely don't want to misconstrue. Like we are, we are pro profit and pro successful business owners. And that is, that is what shared practices is all about. So um, thank you for that. So I, I think this would make sense to then shift to, okay, I was the exception. It kind of was, a little different than how you've done things. What is what does it look like if someone were to join you guys with their practice or or a clinical partner that you normally would have at a practice level? What does that normally look like for you guys, and how has that worked well for you? We try to be flexible in all of those those ways. You know, we've had partners that have bought into existing locations. We've had partners that have acquired alongside us. We've had partners that have rolled equity um, after they sold us their practice. Um, and then we're in the process at this point of, uh, I hesitate to even say it, but because it can kind of get a negative connotation, but I think if anybody wanted to reach out to me and I can explain more about what I mean, I'm more than happy to do that, but creating a, a stock level, hold co level, um, investment opportunity for, for our, our partners to participate in the growth of the overall business versus just their individual. It's not, it's not separating the two. You know, I think, uh, this is not obviously Heartland's the the biggest and the the baddest in the whole the whole game, uh, and they have only stock options. 
Um, and then MB2 has you know, their sidecars and, and all that stuff. And they have equity level at the partnership level. So we're trying to have, it's not, we're not saying either or here. I'm just trying to create another path to partnership that may be a little bit more diversified and that may be a little bit more, um, a little less liquid, but maybe a little higher upside. So, um, We've, we've done all of those relationships and, and frankly, um, and not to glorify the position that, that you were in, but that would have worked for someone, you know, someone who had different goals than you did. Um, you know, because if at the end of the day, if someone wanted to work, you know, that came to us with, with three locations and they wanted to, to, uh, to work with a regional manager on kind of the day to day side and then provide some clinical work here or there, um, and get a distribution check every month. I think that was ultimately, you know, at a high level, that's, that's unfair to categorize it like that. Cause there was obviously negatives that, you know, you came to us and we, I mean, I, I you said you felt guilt. I felt guilt every time, you know, I had to say like, Rich, I don't think that's the best idea. And you know, in this yeah. particular case, you know, I still kind of like, ah, man, I hate to just, I mean, poop on the guy's dreams here, but uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of those things where like, if you were you know perfectly fine with that or, Hey, you know, I want to work a few hours a week and do some clinical work and, uh, you know, and kind of draw a check, so to speak. I mean, I think that would have worked. You know, ultimately, you've made the decision that that wasn't for you, which is, uh, as as George said, it was very impressive to to have the the conviction to say this is not me. You know, this is not for me, um, and walk away from that and, and go pursue uh, something that, frankly, from the very beginning, the first time that we kind of talked about how you saw your your clinical trajectory was, you know teachers implants that kind of style practice and then say ah it's actually what I want I figured that out over time that's originally what I wanted to do um and walk away from that it took a lot of character and a lot of courage um but that relationship even would have worked um for a different person um but I think the more mo way is I want business level support um we're an a la carte company. This sounds pitchy, so I feel free to edit it out. That's not what I, you know, came on for. But you know, we're kind of. Oh, you're fine. You know, we want to, we want to create a, a situation where clinical providers can have any level of business or support they want to to draw off the GPS backbone, and then be and then be dentist. And I think it's not like a unique pitch or anything like that. Lots of groups say you know clinical autonomy and all that stuff, and you know, we just we feel like we can stick our our chest out and say no, we really do provide that because. You know, we, we're dentists, um, both Will and I at the GPS level. All of our partners are general dentists. Um, and we just, it, it, there's other ways in this in this particular um, practice management style to, to drive profit versus, you know, sending out an email and saying, that here's our top 10 providers and here's what they're doing. And here you can be like them too, you know. So um, that's kind of our, our sweet spot is either someone who wants to sell us practice and step back from the business management side um, or a, a, a guy or girl who's coming in and is like, Hey, I can't, I mean, I want to buy three practices, but I can't find a lending for them. Um, I want to be the clinical lead at one of them. Um, or I got the solo location that I'd like to, you know, but you know, I'd like to participate with you guys and maybe one day we buy multiple or maybe I just stay at this practice forever and I don't have to worry about, you know, COVID, you know, I shut down. Oops, sorry. Right. I'm just, uh, you know, call GPS. They'll, uh, they'll, they'll get your PPP on. So that's kind They'll of handle it. thought process. No, and and um, I, I think there's a few things there. The first is, you're right. I, I, I really kind of had a sweet gig of like, if I wanted to be the laziest possible, you guys had a very clear pathway of like, you don't want to see patients. Like, you, you can own these and we've got great regional managers. We've got great doctors. Um, and and you're there to kind of help and support them. But if I was looking for the quickest track out of clinical dentistry to like management and 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 like you said, taking a draw and not having to to see patients, then um I had that. I, I very much had that. And I was very grateful for the opportunity to to do that. And I just I realized that that wasn't for me and and that to continue to add practices or or expand in different ways. In my head at the time, and I probably had a very limited view, um, I saw kind of less of the things I was excited about and more of the things I was stressed about in that that future for me. And I think a lot of it, too, I, I think I, I needed to grow a little bit thicker of a skin, of a management skin of just like dealing with with issues that come up and that that being OK and that being part of it. Um, and then part of it, too, was this uh, desire to to be clinical and surgical and have a full schedule of 
of that type of practice, um, it, it, it just was a realization that like, okay, we just have different goals and that's, that's totally fine. Um, go ahead. No, I think that's, that's, that's the, the thing is like that, you know, you made the comment to me and this is a failure on our part. You know, you've kind of owned a lot of this on this podcast. Um, so that's kind of unfair, but you know, a failure on our part was, you know, you felt like, um, you said that you were middle, ma- middle management. Um, and that's just not the goal of GPS and whether, you were or not doesn't matter because you felt like that. Um, and as a as a partner of GPS, you know that's a, that's that's us losing because we want you to feel involved and we want to feel like you know the the clinicians have autonomy and that the partners have leadership abilities um, and decision making abilities. And a lot of our inexperience with your particular position led us to make mistakes as well. I mean that you know things that should have been handled outside of our, us and decisions that should have been made without us even having involvement, um, maybe didn't. Um, and well, you can caveat or excuse make all you want for us, but ultimately you had a, had a feeling of, of, uh, even though we thought, you know, we look at it like, Oh, that's a pretty sweet gig Richard's got, you know? And you're like, yeah, but you know, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of stuck here and I can't grow. And that's not, that wasn't our intention. And, and frankly, it's a failure on our part to, to, um, either set or meet expectations, one of the two, or maybe both. Um, but you know, what I, what I wanted to come on about was, was that it's like, look, I mean, we, Richard's owned some of the mistakes. Um, I've, I haven't had the chance to own some of the mistakes. So I wanted to, um, and, and really let everybody know that it was goal alignment and that there's, there's just differences in, again, another thing that you guys said that I don't think there's any ill intent about was, you know, that, um, I don't want to screw the quote up, but it was like that you have to be okay with certain things being wrong in a multi-practice setting. And I think wrong's kind of the wrong way to categorize that. You have, yeah, you, have no, you're right. you have to be okay with certain things being different. And um because you know, I've I've been the guy that owned one location that um, you know, took that location from X dollars to double those X dollars. We increased the marketing, we increased the new patients, we but you know these two hands were were who was driving that, um, and and that's it's not easy by any stretch of the imagination. But it's easier when you're the person, and you made this point earlier. When you're the person in there doing it, you're the person who's in there seeing it. And, you, and, and as you scale multiple locations, and, and hopefully you guys experience not the problems, but hopefully you guys can see what I'm talking about a little bit more because you're able to scale the implant side of what you're working at. There's things that it's not even that it's not right or that it's not perfect. There is just that that is what it is because this is a multi-practice situation. So um, that's kind of, you know, as I step back and look at this, it's like, okay, this is really just a difference in, you know, goals and two, what Richard and I think George, um, and this is not a knock on him, but, you know, from that podcast that he's just not had the, the opportunity to experience yet is that, it's not right or wrong. It's not about money or not money. It's just that when you go from, I have my two eyeballs on that practice all the time. I know everybody in there intimately. I know how much they make. I know what their hours are. I know what, you know, their family situation is. That's a different dynamic than that practice is eight hours away. They've had three assistant changes in the last year. I don't even know which one's there anymore. How can I support that person? And I really can't like, I need, my partner or my regional manager or something like that to help drive that, that, um, that relationship. So it's just, a, it's just a difference. I mean, I, it was probably tongue in cheek, but you know, George said, uh, what, what do you say that it was easy to scale multiple locations, you know, that you guys did. And, yeah. And I, and I, I have told him, I, I am, I am the first one telling George that like, this is not as easy as you think it is. And he, and, and, uh, I, I, I continue to be, I, I rain on the parade of shared practices way too often of like, guys, this is crazy. What are we doing? Um, this is going to be harder. And here's all the ways that it's going to be harder. Um, Look, and, and I've lived and seen some of that. And and we're going to experience some of that firsthand uh, as well. And you are, you're good guys are good operators. I mean, it's you're probably George's, uh, I mean, you've not had the chance to kind of show your chops to the extent that George has yet at a solo location, but he's probably a better solo operator at the practice level than I am. Um, or the, the will is, but that doesn't mean that 
okay, I can I can replicate that exact situation across five locations. So, you know, I think he made it tongue in cheek. He's like, hey, we're we're making we're taking these implant locations because that's a challenge and it's it's too easy to scale, you know, GP practices. Right. Or like, yeah, well, yeah, if you do one at a time and you stare at the practice and you guys, you know, you get numbers from owners and you know, as your practice underwater um, segment, which is awesome, and, and you're sharing that, you know, here's what your numbers are telling you, here's what you can do differently. Um, really good at that. And, and, and frankly, probably better than I am. Um, but if that person was asking about their fifth location that they don't go to, like, how do I increase new patient numbers? Oh, by the way, that doctor over there doesn't want to see anybody else. And if I put another provider in there, it's going to cut into his or her provider time. And now that person's upset and the staff doesn't want to work on Fridays anyway. And you know what I mean? It's, 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 again, it's not a locker's right or wrong situation, but it's certainly not easy. Um, and, and there's nuance to it. Yeah. And, and, and I think, I think uh, we definitely did not give weight to that nuance in the, in the way that, that we should. Yeah. I mean, I don't want you to feel like I'm bitching or anything like that. It's just more of like, it's, 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 you don't know what you don't know. And I'll give you guys full credit on operationally, you know, you personally on what your goals were matching on having the character and conviction to go do it george from his operational knowledge and taking that location and growing it but i wanted to provide from my perspective um you know here's here's what i saw and also for for any listeners that take value in this because i think it is a growing segment is what we haven't had time to speak on today uh really yet is hopefully a lot of these things are things that gps does well and not necessarily uh, you know so when you're looking at just like you're looking at the evaluate a solo location, it's like, you know, you guys have done a good job and hopefully I've helped in that way saying, here's how you evaluate this $800,000 practice. And it may actually be the better option than the $1.9 million office that is 95% doctor. Um, you you kind of need to look at the same way if you're looking at partnership groups, because there's lots of. Where does the equity live? How does the equity come back to you? Is there distributions or is it HOCO stock and it's illiquid and you can only sell it to another doctor? Um, how clinical autonomously are they? You know, is this, you know, what labs and supplies do they use and how do they dictate, you know, how that ordering process works? Who's my direct contact? Who's my direct, you know, my answer into a regional manager who's answering to a, you know, national manager who's answering to the COO who ultimately gets to the COO? And then he, uh, or am I answering? I think all of our doctors would know that they come directly to me um, or will. So when you're evaluating this, you know, we haven't had time and I didn't want this to be pitchy or sales or anything like that. But it's it, it, you can't really group partner it, multiple or multiple location DSOs together. And even more specifically, you can't really group multi-location partnership opportunities together because the structures are so different. And then even if you have the exact same structure, Ultimately, it's the people that you're working with, um, and you've been kind enough, I think, to to give us great references on that side. Um, and I wanted to kind of caveat a couple of the uniquenesses um, of the situation that we both found ourselves in. Um, hopefully, people feel like I've taken the some ownership of some of the things that that we did poorly, which was expectation setting, follow through on that, probably not spending enough time. Um, working directly with you to find ways to implement some of those ideas that you had. These are all failures on all part things that we hopefully have learned from um, because, uh, you know, you guys, you've taken a lot of the, like, Hey, I just didn't want that. Um, you know, but at the same time, we could have, we could have tried to help figure out a way to, to make that. But end of the day, I think we both got something that we're, that we're proud of um, and remained friends, remained colleagues. Um, I would have no problem referring to you. I don't think you'd have any problem referring to me. Um, and the, it ended as, as, as well as it possibly could have given the circumstances. So. Absolutely. And I appreciate your honesty and openness on this and, and owning up to those things that it's like, you say those things. And I'm like, you really didn't do anything wrong on my perspective. But um, I, I will also say that I continue to, you know, you, you occasionally send people my way that give me a call and be like, Hey, what is it really like to partner with these guys? And I'm very upfront to tell them, I absolutely would recommend working with them. They they did what they said they would. They didn't come in and change these practices and you know implement all these different things that are going to uh, impede on on people's ability to practice the way that they see fit. Um, and 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 I feel like 
at at the practice level, the team, the patients, the doctor, no one felt like it was this big change. It was more just like, no, we're here to support you and and keep doing what you're doing. You're doing great dentistry. You're taking care of people. Keep that up. And and we're here to back you up. And that all along the way happened. And I've continued to to tell potential doctors who um, are considering working with you guys that absolutely, if that's what you're looking for, if you if you want to be a clinical partner and don't want to mess with all this other stuff and have realized that practice ownership, the the business side of things is not fun to you, these are the guys to work with. So I, I continue to send people your way and to, to recommend um, that, that great partners, great people, um, and, and people that I inherently trust and continue to, to recommend. So thank you. I really appreciate that. I mean, obviously at the end of the day, that's what matters most to us. I mean, it's, you want to feel like you're doing right, you know, out there in the, you know, there's lots of groups that are expanding and growing and you want to feel like at least that people feel like you got their best interest at heart and that you're working for them. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's a job, you know, you, you are trying to earn a living. Um, hopefully we provide a platform for other people to earn a living as well. That, um, is supportive and, and, and as stress-free as it can be, you know, working a eight to five or what, I mean, Dennis case much longer than that, or much shorter than that, depending on their goals. Um, but I do think, and, and not to put you on the spot or anything like that, but this, you know, we've talked about this before. It's a growing segment of of dentistry. I mean, a lot of people are getting more into partnerships and maybe I'm not the right person to speak on it because I obviously have a bias um, and I, uh, I co-own a group that provides those services. But, you know, the same way that hopefully I provided value early on and, and shared practices on the valuation of the dental side, I think it's worth um you know, an episode or two or, or conversations, people can reach out to me on it. Again, caveat that I have a bias. I mean, it's I obviously own it. part of it. Is, so so it, you got to take what I even I say with a grain of salt on what's best and not best. Um, but just please look at, you know, it, don't group them all together um, and understand what you're signing up for, just like you will with the practice. It's like, hey, I'm signing up with this group and I'm a partner. It's like, well, what does that mean? Like, am I getting money for it? Am I, do I have ownership? Where do I have ownership? How does my ownership work? What are my rights for my ownership? If there is a sale of this, do I get anything for it or do I continue my ownership in a new way? Um, lots of lots of little details that, um, again, I obviously have a, a, a preferred path because I'm trying to execute that preferred path. Um, but there's a lot of good ones out there. There's a lot of bad ones out there. And um, I think it's worth educating yourselves on. Um, the same way that you would solo op practice opportunities or um, multiple practice opportunities. No, absolutely. And the, and the one fear I've had all along on the shared practices podcast is overselling single site ownership to people that really shouldn't be practice owners because it's, they don't, they don't enjoy it. They don't like it. It's, it's not for them. And therefore they don't do a great job of it because they felt like this was the only way to do it and they didn't have other options. And so you've provided and continue to provide a way for people to be owners without the burden of the, the business decision-making, the day-to-day you know, frustrations of kind of worrying about the numbers and all of those things. Um, and I, I think it's a great way for people to be part of ownership without everything falling on their own shoulder and including all the stress. I think it's just, it goes back to us being kind of empathetic. I mean, that shows, you know, that you understand, you know, that there's certain people that, yeah, it may be financially more beneficial if you get in there and you work 35 or 40 hours a week clinically, and then you are okay with on the weekend doing payroll or on the weekend, you know, or, or doing interviews after working hours or what, and none of those things are, yeah, you can make more money that way. And that's, and, if you want a lot of a lot of autonomy, then practice ownership is the only way to go. Um, but for the people in dental towns of the world and the, the different podcasts of the world to get out there and beat their chest, but why would you work for somebody else? Just go on for yourself. Look how much money you're losing. Jason Wood calling you out, by the way. Go on a practice one time and then come back. <laughs> like you can edit if you want to, but I honestly do not care. Um, no, it, uh, and and, and I, I am not publicly calling out Jason Wood, uh, but. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, no, I, I'm not calling him out personal. Like I don't know him personally at all. But what I'm calling out is the idea that that's the only way, and that you're doing it somehow yeah. incorrectly if you're not, because that just it's not fair to the the person. Like that, 
I've got sellers that, you know, I think their lives are, uh, this is so pitchy, I know, but like their, their lives are better because they sold GPS a practice or a stake in the practice. And now they're able to go at four o'clock to the ball game, you know, for their, for their 10 year old kid. Like, and that's not wrong. They made a decision to take less money as you would if you left any other job that was didn't fit, you know, maybe your investment bank, you're working 150 hours a week. And you're like, that sucks. I'm going to be you know, a loan officer for a hundred thousand, but at least I don't have to work a hundred hours a week. So I think it's just being empathetic and understanding that people's needs and goals are differently. So for them idiots who don't ever own a practice to get up there and say, like, this is the only way and you're doing it wrong. Otherwise, it's not empathetic or not supportive of the individual person. So I, I really appreciate what you said and that, you know, you, you, you fight that as like, hey, you know, we want to provide you the information should you choose that that's what's best for you and maybe hopefully the easiest way. Um, based on our experiences and the failures that we've made and the failures that other people have made and what we've you know, learned, this is the easiest path and the best path to profitability with the less amount of stress. But at this end of the day, it still may be too much. And the implementation, not that it's even too much, just not what you want to do. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. As you can tell, I got a little bit passionate about it because I hear it That's too great. much. But um, I, I really appreciate you saying that that particular line more than anything because it is – it's not about us or going and partner with someone else or it's not about partnering with 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 any other group it's just about doing what's best for you because you, know, you went to four years to middle school and maybe a couple years of residency and got a couple you know 20 years ahead of you i mean do it in a way that like you at least can get through it make a good living and 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 do what you want to do and not be married to the profession because hey, amen absolutely by the way Dentistry is rough. Dentistry is definitely rough. So well, great. Th- this has been hundred. Thank you for, for coming on and for uh, having as much grace as you've had. I, I, th- I think especially with, you know, you've gotten to hear some of this play out on the podcast as it's all, you know, happened after the fact. And, and I, I absolutely am grateful that you're willing to come on and share a holistic perspective on on the whole thing and on our experiences together and what I could have done different, what you guys could have done different. Ultimately, like you said, we've, we've learned from it and have come out on the other side, uh, good friends and, and trusting each other. And, uh, so thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. Oh, I appreciate the platform. I have always appreciate what you guys are doing at Shared Practices. Again, it speaks to what I just talked about, making it easier um, and giving, giving guidance in a pathway that hopefully makes sense for, certain people. So if anybody uh, I've, I've been reached out to, uh, this speaks to you guys' podcast success, been reached out to from more people from, you know, I've, I've been on, I've been fortunate enough to be on a few different platforms, more shared practices listeners than any other podcast reach out to me um, for not necessarily advice, but, you know, I, I, hope, I try to refer a lot back to, you know, I just don't have time to evaluate practices anymore, but uh, the patient base is passionate. They're getting a lot of value out of it. I appreciate the opportunity to be part of the platform. If anybody ever needs anything to me from me, you know, H Smith at GPS DDS.com. Um, Richard, I mean, if it's a, a situation where it needs a little bit more personal time, Richard has my number, um, text or call. I'm, I'm available. Um, more than happy to provide guidance and, and talk a little bit about what we do um, or uh, what may be better for, uh, for you and help you evaluate your situation. So I appreciate the platform. I appreciate you telling your side of the story, giving us a chance to tell our side of the story. And more than anything, I appreciate the way that you handled and that we've been able to handle what potentially could have been challenging. And it's turned out that I think both of us have got, you know, what we needed and wanted out of, out of, a uh, you know, we, we would still like to have you as, as in the area, but um, <laughs> at, at least we didn't get, you know, we weren't in a terrible situation um, because of the way that it, it all went down. So I appreciate it. No, for sure. And, I, and I've said uh, it could have gone nuclear, you know, of, of practice divorce, partnership divorces. And, uh, and, and, and it didn't because uh, I trusted you guys. And, and I always felt that uh, even when we had different visions, we were all working in each other's best interest. So I, I really appreciate that. So thank, thank you, Hunter. Thanks, Richard. See ya. All right. We'll talk with you all next time on the Shared Practices Podcast.